Okay, the last class we went over the executor's letter and also trust. We went over the common law irrevocable trust and we went over the business law trust. So now we're going to go over the UCC. But before we get to that, as always, we have to start with nationality. Because that is always the call of the day. All right? I just got to remind everyone. So when we look at the hierarchy of law, number one source in order of law is natural law. All right? That's what it is, natural law. So natural law exists as it is, being what it is, functioning as it functions, and according to laws which make it what it is. So natural law is the given, all right? Your nationality correlates to natural law. That's the highest level of law, is nationality, as it is natural, i.e., when you claim your nationality, you become a natural person of natural law. All right? It's the regularities that makes existence able to be what it is at all. This is why any field of human endeavor presumes that this is something there is to discover. Some order, some regularity. This is why we have a science and philosophy and medicine. We are presupposed that what we are doing is discovering and learning and being able to apply something that already pre-exists. So once again, natural law is simply the given, all right? So when law begins to emerge in human consciousness, into human consciousness, thoughts, words, deeds, your actions, your mores, your folk ways, your traditions, your customs, your culture, you have what is the most fundamental of all human law, all right? For what? or for want of a better word or to describe this, this most fundamental of all human law is called economics or commercial law. So it has to do with human survival, with human interactions of any kind, any relationships, buying, selling, or trading, or relating in any way. Matter of fact, remember, commercial Law, when you look it up in Black's Law Dictionary, you will see the word intercourse in the definition. So next after um, natural law is commerce or commercial law, right? Remember, commerce, into, into, um, intercourse. And so in the pecking in order of the derivative being removed from natural law and therefore being inferior after commercial law or commerce is common law. Common law emerges basically in England, all right? And being that we are in, we speak English, we are in a um, colonialized society of England, um, colonialists, their descendants, all right? So out of the dispute over um, a load of land, boundaries, sovereign ownership of land, commercial law is the law of the land, right? Commercial law, of course, give rise to the jury system and many, many writs and processes what the government has absorbed into their rulership schemes and statutized and made into regulations and processes in the court. So common law is valid to the extent that it does not conflict with commercial law, right? And it does, and neither one conflicts with natural law, right? So after common law comes, governments come. So common law is even higher than the structure of governments, right? And then comes governments and their laws and legislative regulations and so forth, right?
Right? Below that, we get the garbage of politics. <laughs> okay? So, politics is not over government. Government is not over common law. Common law is not over commercial law. And none are over natural law, which natural law is universal law. The seven principles of Tahuti fits into this scheme. All right? The seven laws of Tahuti fits into this. All right? The seven laws of Tahuti are what? The law of mentalism, correspondence, polarity, cause and effect, gender or sex, rhythm, vibration. Okay? These are the seven natural laws of Tahuti, universal laws. Even the cardinal principles of his wife, Mayat, fits into this scheme. Right? What are her laws? Her laws is truth, righteousness, balance, order, harmony, reciprocity, right? as well as also, I would say, love. So the same principle that we have within the within the um, the Moore Science Temple of America of Love, Truth, Peace, Freedom, and Justice, those are actually the principles of Mayat. Okay. Those are the principles of Mayat. Hey, somebody tell me the four principles of the Nation of Islam flag. Freedom, justice, equality, and um, freedom, justice, and equality is, is Islam. Exactly. So they even have equality there in which that would give rise to six. And then collectively, we talk about the principles of Mayat. Because Nation Islam utilizes at least three of the same principles as the more science temple of America with equality being there, which correlates all back to the laws of Mayat. Okay? That's what it does. Now, we talk about affidavits because we talk about commercial law. Remember, commercial law, which is commerce, is underneath natural law. And according to the Ten Maxims of Law, right? When we look at the Ten Maxims of Law, the most important one to me is number four. Truth, which is my eye, is expressed in the form of an affidavit. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. So your mayat, your maatian principles are expressed in a affidavit. Taking it from just a one-dimensional state into a two-dimensional state, eventually into a three-dimensional state, and making it work for you. Okay? Anybody knows that if you want something to come true, you speak it into existence, you think it into existence, but you also write it into existence. So your truth is written. That's your spell. Spelling. Casting spells. Your paper. That is through truth, which is expressed in the form of an, of an affidavit. And an affidavit is your solemn expression of your truth. In commerce, an affidavit must be occupied and must underlay and form the foundation for any commercial transaction whatsoever. So anytime you're dealing with any case, it must be in the form of, of an affidavit. Never do motions. Because the judge has the ability to deny motions in a court of law. He cannot deny a affidavit. 
You cannot deny an affidavit. You can't deny a notice. You cannot deny. So every time you have a court case, God forbid if you have to have one, but if you do, make sure it's in the form of, of an affidavit. How you do that? You put affidavit at the goddamn top of the page. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, Dominique, does, does this same thing go with the social with the um social security law that they got? Social security is their de facto system. However, you can play the game. All right. For social security to be effective, it must be predicated on the birth certificate. Okay. Right? So say. So so say somebody mm -hmm. has a birth certificate, but right. they don't have a social security number. Okay. You now, now like, that's what, the like, situation. Like, if they have a birth certificate so, and no social security, then I, I mean, how, how they how are they going to eat? <laughs> yeah. So I'm saying like I like I'm in the um I'm like I'm in the process of doing my UCC three, and I have my birth certificate, but I don't have my social like mm -hmm. I don't have a social security number. So it's like I'm at a standstill, and I'm and I'm at a like I'm trying to find out what I can do to get it to correct it. You would have to get a you would have to get a social security card. Oh, why, but why, why you why explain to me why you don't have one? As being uh, a grown me, uh, uh, me and me and somebody. Uh, I was born in New York City. I was born in New York. I was right. born in New York, me and somebody else person me and somebody else had the same first and last name or whatever. So we was given the same social security number at this time in the hospital. We didn't know this until recently. You know, recently like when I filed for a copy of my social security card, they informed me that like some of the information in the account for me is wrong. So it, it, it came out that me and somebody else has the same social security number, so they just basically blanked up the social security number so I don't have a social security number right now. And I'm incarcerated so I can't go down there and see them in person. Mm. So it's like, it's like, you know what I'm saying? It, it complicates right. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. definitely is complicated because I never heard of a case like that. Um, you see, and they and they're not trying to send no representative up here to talk to me, and they're not trying to take me there to get a Well, of course not, because while, you in, because while you are in jail, you are what is called chattel property. You are property yeah. of the state, as they say. You know, so yeah. no one's not trying to accommodate you because right now you're property, um, and yeah. property own property. Um, that, that's really what that is. Um, that's, that's actually inside um, prison or jail, or outside, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So as long as we are declared property, we can't possibly own property, you know? So um, that's what's going on. And normally the way that we do it, um, we don't mess with the birth certificate, you know? Yeah. And But we do go and do a common law name correction, put that name on the security card, and then on a state ID, you know, and if you're driving in commercial venues, you know, such as an 18-wheeler, taxi cab driver, Uber, so on forth and so on, then you can do it on your um, DMV slash license, all right? But um, the other way around, I never encountered a situation like that before. I never heard um, that they got information incorrect. What you would have to do is do a power of attorney and have somebody to work outside for you on your behalf. That's what you're going to have to do. You have to do a power of attorney. And when you do a power... You're experiencing technical difficulties. You may not hear everyone on the call. You will be prompted when the conference is reconnected. Can you hear me? This conference has been reconnected. His home. His home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, now that's deep because they just cut me off. Yeah, I was about to say, like, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah, I heard yeah, it. it was kind of weird. Yeah. I yeah. Anything. So, uh, 
to make to not not to disrupt the um the session or whatever, but uh like yeah. So what you will have to do is this is what I'm saying, brother, that you're gonna have to do a power of attorney for someone who's outside who can work on your behalf. They can get the social security card and rectify the situation for you. That's I did all of that. They, the only thing that you can do. Place, the social security place is telling me that they don't recognize powers of attorney. Like my own mother went down there and my sister, my power of attorney, my fiance, my power of attorney. They went down there. Since and when? They told them to recognize. Uh, this is like two months ago. Huh? No, I was just asking since when they don't recognize it. That's deep. See, that's some new. That's yeah, something that's new. That's new. Yeah, that's what they say. Like, I, 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 and I kind of feel, I kind of feel that it's a, um, that it's like, uh, like they got me in this little maze. Like they're trying to just make me right. So, well, what you're gonna have to do then, brother, is gonna have to write a letter and get it to your mother, and before she can send it off yeah. to the security agency, and then they're gonna have to rectify the matter by way of your letter. Okay. 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 All right. So I just really, um, but I need my social security card in order to finish my UCC. Right. You have to. Otherwise, you can't be what is called a um, a creditor. Okay. All right. Your discharging right. process won't work unless you are a creditor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, what happens is that when a person is in the creditor, uh, within about two weeks or so, it comes back and flips on them. So, yeah, they might have written it off for about two weeks to a month or so, but then it will come right back on there, um, onto their credit okay. report or whatever the case is. And um, so, so that's that that's the situation or the problem. All right. And with the IRS, they'll give you a um, frivolous filing letter for five thousand dollars. So you have to make sure All that right. you are. That you are, you know, the um, security, um, the secured um, party creditor. Secured party creditor. Yeah, yeah. Right. You have to make sure that okay. you're the secured okay. party creditor. Okay. Okay. Do you think? Do you think I can like uh, sue the Social Security Administration for negligence? Um. Yeah, but that's that'd be a waste of your time and energy, brother. That's something in which that would take years, and by that time, you know, you'd probably be out. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah no just the only thing you have to do is just simply write a letter telling that you want to rectify the situation, you'll understand what's going on, and they'll write you back, they'll correspond with you. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the clear clarity in the situation. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So you say the social security law, does that fall under the commercial law? Back to where you was uh picking off at um, actually falls on the government. Okay. Because the IRS is a daughter of the Federal Reserve. Matter of fact, the IRS are the accountants for the Federal Reserve Bank and for the banking system. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's all right, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was like a real eye You know, it was real eye yep. Yeah. It's part of the defecto government. See, somebody go yeah, to a dictionary and read de facto for me, and then read the, um, the jury for me. We've done this before, but, you know, sometimes we have new people, so we want to make sure that, you know, the clarity comes for everybody. And sometimes okay. things over again, it even helps you, even though you might have heard it before, you might not have heard it in such a way till it's something in which that might click. You know, so somebody pull out the okay. blessing Dictionary and read de facto government for me, or de facto, and then George. De facto. Can you might hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and yeah. clear. You have one minute remaining. Yeah, I can hear you now. They say, in fact, actually, indeed, in reality. Thus, an office, position, or status existing under a claim or color of right, such as deputy county clerk. All right. I'm going to go look it up myself. Oh, sorry. Thanks. In fact, no government. 
one that maintains itself Thank you for using GTL. by a display of force against the will of rightful legal government and is successful, at least temporarily, in overturning the institutions of the rightful legal government by setting up its own in loop thereof. All right, now read the drawer. D E J U R E, de jure. And tell me when you find it, I'm going to continue reading on um, truth as expressed in the form of an affidavit. So, there can be no valid commercial transaction without someone putting their neck on the line and stating, this is true, correct, complete, and not meant to mislead. When you issue an affidavit as a two edged sword, it cuts both ways. Someone has to take responsibility for saying that this is the real situation. It can be called a true bill. And remember, that's what they give you when they give you an indictment. An indictment is called a true bill. As they say in a grand jury. So when you issue an affidavit in commerce, you get the power of an affidavit. All right? And what is the power of an affidavit? Well, let's see. The affidavit. Commerce in everyday life is the vehicle or the glue that holds or binds the corporate body politic together. More specifically, commerce consists of a mode of interacting, doing business, or resolving disputes, whereby all matters are executed under oath or affirmed, certified on each party, commercial liability, be sworn affidavit or affirm affidavit, or what is intended to possess the same effect as true, correct, and complete, not misleading, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as they say, so help me God. This affidavit is usually required for an application for a driver's license or an IRS form 1040 or voter registration, a direct treasury account, a notary copy certification, or certifying a document. Certifying a document. All right, that's what you did with your nationality. That's what the notary was for, to bear witness to that. And nearly every single document that the system desires others to be bound or obligated, or the ones that you hold to make them bound or obligated, right? Such as your nationality. That's why you was put. That's why you put it on the public record. Those affidavits put on the public record to make them bound and obligated to you having expressed your truth. In what? A form of an affidavit. Such means of signing is an oath or commercial affidavit executed under penalty of perjury. True, correct, and complete. Whereas in court settled, um, setting, testimony oral is stated in jurisdictional or judicial um, terms by being sworn or affirmed to be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. In addition to asserting all matters under solemn oath or personal, commercial, financial, and legal liability for the validity of each and every statement, the participant must provide material evidence, ledgering, bookkeeping, um, providing the truth, validating of validity, um, relevance, and veritably of each and every particular assertion to sustain credibility. This is why your documentation has a fact page. Notice that within your nationality, you have an affidavit of fact page in which that you go through the various facts. Why? Because it says each and every particular assertion to sustain credibility. So commerce is antecedent to and more fundamental to society that courts and legal systems and exists and functions without respects to court or legal systems. 
All right. Commercial law, the non-statutorily variety as presented below, as I read, just four of the one through ten maxims of law, is the economic extensions of natural law into man's social world, all right, and is universal in nature. The, um, the, um, the foundational invariants, um, necessary and su um, sufficient principles or maxims of commerce pertaining herein are, as we stated, workman is, high, is worthy of his um, workman is worth worthy of his, of his hire, all equal under the law. All right. If you read one, workman is worthy of his hire. Prophet Noble Ali put that in the front of the Holy Quran Circle Seven. He said that a man is worthy of his hire, and that is the exact same as number one of the maxims of law. Coincidence? I don't think so. All other equals under the law or equality before the law, or more precisely, all are equal under the law as God's law, moral and natural law. Right? In commerce, truth is sovereign. My favorite, truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. An unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. That means if you write an affidavit and the DA, assistant DA, do not rebut what is stated in your affidavit, then you've won the case. Because claim made in your affidavit, if not rebutted, emerges as the truth of the matter. He who does deny omits. They acquiesce. They was quiet on the matter. Therefore, you won. Why? Because you stated the facts for the case. By way of what? Your affidavit, because your truth was expressed in the form of an affidavit. Six, an unrebutted affidavit becomes the judgment in commerce. There's nothing left to resolve. So you're standing there letting them continue on with the case, and they never rebutted your affidavit. You're the jackass. Part my French. You never allow them to continue moving on. You object. And state your affidavit has not been rebutted by the um by the so-called DA, assistant DA. And because of that, there's nothing left to resolve. Any proceedings in the court, tribunal, or arbitration form on form consists of a contest or a duel. That's who you're battling against. You you are battling against the so-called state, the people, the um lawyer, the DA, the assistant DA. All the various titles of commercial affidavits were in the point remaining unrebutted in the end stands as truth and matters to which the judgment of the law is applied. Seven, in commerce for any matter to be resolved must be expressed. And how does it be expressed? Number four just told you, right? It must be, ex truth is expressed in a form of an affidavit. You see how it keep going back to itself again? This is how the maxims of law works. And you have to take everything that I'm saying into heavy consideration. Because in commerce, for any matter to be resolved, must be expressed. No one is a mind reader. You have to put your position out there. You have to state what the issue is and to have someone to talk about and resolve. Legal maxim, he who fails to assert his rights has none. So if you don't put forth an affidavit before you go to court, you have no rights. This is why they ask you, you know that you're waiving your rights. And you stand there, mm -hmm. They ask you, you know that you're waiving your constitutional rights. And you just say, okay. <laughs> you just say, okay. That's crazy. That is crazy. But this is what happens. All the time. I've seen it. Okay? I've seen it. Shouldn't be like that, but that's what takes place. That's what's going on. All right, so 
9. Well, excuse me, let's go to 8. He who leaves the battlefield first lose by default. So if they don't answer your or rebut your affidavit, they lost. And the judge is supposed to be the referee and supposed to end the match. That's what's supposed to happen. This means that the affidavit, which is unrebutted point for point, and that's what the DA has to do. He has to rebut your affidavit point by point. Otherwise, it stands in truth and commerce because it hasn't been rebutted and he has left the battlefield. That's like you out there playing Michael Jordan and he gets tired of you scoring on him and he just leaves the court because he don't want to be um, humiliated. You won. <laughs> All right? Governments allegedly exist to resolve disputes. That's what the judge is supposed to be there for. He's supposed to be the referee. And when the DA or assistant DA don't answer your affidavit point by point, you've won. So we allow them to continue adjudicating when the matter has already been resolved. Governments allegedly exist to be substitutes for the dueling field and the battlefield for soul disputes. Conflicts of affidavits of truth are resolved peacefully, reasonably, instead of by violence. So remember when you see the gunslingers back during the wild, wild west, you can see they um, come back to back and then walk for it several yards then turn around facing each other. And whoever has the fastest hands, that's who won. Well, that's the same thing with, with your um, affidavit. Your affidavit is your gun. That's your weapon. So people can take their disputes into court and have them all open up and resolved instead of going out and marching 10 paces and turning to kill or injure. Legal maxim, he who does not repeal a wrong when he can, occasions it. Sat sacrifice is the measure of credibility. No willingness to sacrifice, no liability, responsibility, authority, or measure of conviction. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. A person must put himself on the line, assume a position, take a stand. This is what we come out, you must stand on your square. As regard to matters at hand, and one cannot realize the potential gain without also exposing himself, herself to the potential of loss. One who is not damaged, put at risk, or willing to swear an oath on his commercial liability to claim authority for the truth of his statements and legitimacy of his actions has no basis to assert claim or charges or forfeits or credibility and fight and rights or right. Legal maxim, he who bears the burden us to also derive the benefits. All right? Also part of nine is the sacrifice of a lien. All right? In commerce, a lien or claim can be satisfied in no in any one of the three ways, there's the only three ways you can do it. By someone rebutting your affidavit, which another affidavit of, of his own, her own, point by point, until the matter resolved as to who is correct. Excuse me for a second here. Yes. Oh. 
Okay. I got to write them back in a second here. But right now, let me try to get this going. All right. So, by someone rebutting your affidavit with another affidavit of his own point by point until the matter is resolved as to who is correct in case of non-resolution, you convene a sheriff common law jury based on the Seventh Amendment concerning a dispute involving a claim of more than $20, or you All right. You can um, you convene a sheriff common law jury based on the Seventh Amendment concerning a dispute involving a claim of more than twenty dollars, or you can use three disinterested parties to make judgment. The only other way to satisfy a lien is to pay it. Now, this is when the UCC comes into play, because the UCC filed at the county as a non UCC filing is the lien. All right, this is where we get ready to get into this now. That's the lien. All right? Ten. So the tenth maxim of law is a lien or claim can be satisfied only through rebuttalment or rebuttal, excuse me, by affidavit, point by point. Resolution by jury or payment. That's it. Okay. That's it. So, that's what we have to learn. All right. Affidavit properties. Once again, the fourth commercial maxim states a fundamental aspect of commercial law. Truth is expressed by means of an affidavit. Since every or each individual experiences whatever he does from his own or her own particular perspective in time and space, all right, and through his unique nature and machinery of consciousness, all truth is subjective. Truth like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And as much as everyone has will, has free will, and is reductible units of experience, choice, responsibility, and self-government, only each particular man or woman who can speak his or her own truth and has the right or obligation to do so. No one is obliged nor qualified to express the truth of another. Okay, as per the famous line in Tennessee, the Tennyson book, The Courtship of Miles Standish, why does you speak? Why don't you speak for yourself, John? All right, so dispute resolution law requires a universal acceptance means for someone to assert his subjective truth in a manner that all understanding is intended to be uttered without evocation, concealment, deception, or insincerity. An affidavit, especially an affidavit sworn, truth, correct, and complete, has evolved over time to be the accepted process by which everyone expresses truth in the most solemn, absolute, ceremonial means possible past which nothing exists. An affidavit as a solemn and sworn statement of truth automatically renders the offense the subject of charges of perjury if any portion of his affidavit is false. Okay? This is why you would never get a rebuttal on the fact that you are the indigenous people or aboriginal indigenous people of this land as stated in your nationality affidavits. They can't rebut that. And they never will try. 
Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition, defines affidavit. Affidavit is a written or print, printed declaration or statement of facts made voluntarily and confirmed by oath or affirmation of the party making it, taken by a person having authority to administer it, such oath or affirmation. That's what the notary public is. That's part of the administrative process of commercial, of the commercial um, law or venue. In the sense that each notary public is a deputy of the Secretary of State. And yes, it is de facto. And this is why we also have an area for two witnesses. I wish that we would like for them to be Moors who sign or autograph your affidavit as far as in the witness areas or at least 18 years of age and know that that's the way that you feel about it. Was an oath or as we would say affirmation because we don't do oaths as Moors. We only affirm. Oath, any form of attestation by which a person signifies that he is bound and conscious to perform and act faithfully and truly. An affidavit of truth of a statement which renders one willfully or certain untruth um, statements punishable for pre prejury, perjury. An outward pledge by the person taking it by his attestation of promise is made under immediate sense of responsibility to God. A solemn apply, um, appeal to the supreme being in attestation of the truth of his statement, an eternal pledge or a salvation um, made in verification of statements made or to be made, coupled with an appeal to a sacred or venerated uh, object in evidence of the serious and relevant state of mind of the party or with the invocation to a supreme being to witness the words of the party and to visit him with punishment if they be false. Right? So this is the way in order to, you know, like they said, little Kim, when she had to go to jail, she purged, she purged herself. Perjury. Right? She purged herself. All right? So, um, perjured herself. Right? So, so what you have to wait in order to characterize an affidavit, right? like I said, affidavit at the top of the page. The document will contain the characteristics and properties itemized below to wit an affidavit. So state facts, truth. That's why you have an area for statements of facts and statements of truth in your affidavit of your nationality. Only on the basis of firsthand personal knowledge, not conjecture, theory, or hearsay. Facts. All right? We didn't say, oh, man, I heard that from John. John told me that I was indigenous. <laughs> no, we went to sources, books, authors, Europeans, Albions. The facts suggest, um, stated must express direct knowledge of the affiant. That information and belief, which is hearsay, okay? If someone expresses his subjective truth and others verify the same truth in their own subjective terms and say truth is labeled as objective facts, the abstract map is acknowledged by others as accurately representing the territory. Cannot be argumentative. Must not draw conclusions of law. Can be executed and served at any time without notice to the adverse party because an affidavit is not subject to cross-examination. It is an ex parte processing, a proceeding. Excuse me. So this is what I'm talking about, that a judge can't say anything concerning your affidavit. It's not subject to cross-examination. 
must be certified witness by an officer of the um, officer of the state authorized to administer oath, usually a notary public, as I told you earlier. If it is not so sworn or firm, it would not be considered as being an affidavit. Right? And as you see here, it says witness. So this is why we put two witnesses on the documentation. Constitutes one of the three kinds of testimonies. The one, two, being disposition, uh, disposi disposition and direct oral examination and stand as un um, uncon um, troverted evidence, if not timely rebutted point by point by proper counter affidavit executed by the adverse party. In other words, the so-called state, the people, the DA or attorney uh, or lawyer, esquire, whatever you want to call him or herself, must be executed by being sworn to, correct, and complete, i.e., under oath, defining the degree and nature of the commercial liability must take by the affinity from the um, veracity, accuracy, relevance, and veritability of everything stated in the affidavit can be invalidated or nullified only by being rebutted point for point by the counter affidavit sworn to, correct, and, co and complete. Stands as the truth concerning each point that is not rebutted by counter affidavit as above. The entire affidavit stands as truth in the matter if not answered at all. So they never de um, rebut your affidavit and you put your affidavit of nationality in the public record and then you take it and enter into the law case that they have against you and they never rebut it, you won the case. Especially if you add an affidavit of um, counter um, countersuit, a countersuit affidavit or counterclaim affidavit and if you add a notice of special appearance or a notice of restricted appearance, and if they don't rebut any of those three that you have entered by, either by certified mail return receipt or if you have gone down personally and gone to the criminal division and entered it into the case yourself, into the record via based on the case number, Without a competent witness, i.e. testimony, no court has the power to act. All right? Judgment may, by, um, may be made solely on evidence, but all evidence requires that a competent witness attest its validity, i.e. verifies the evidence submitted. Without a competent witness, a judgment is void. In court, the adverse party has the right to cross-examine. When testimony is issued, via affidavit, the adverse party has the right obligation if he, she desires not to have an affinity, affinity, um, affidavit stand as truth and judgment of the law to respond to the de um, affidavit point by point via counter affidavit, sworn, truth, counter, or correct, and um, complete. This is how I got the brother out of federal prison because I did a habeas corpus affidavit in which they, the judge, uh, which the DA had to rebut it point by point. He sent his, I sent in mine. He sent, he sent, um, sent me, um, the brother sent me the DA's um, rebuttal to it. And I sent another one in which that he just gave up and left the battlefield. So they released that brother. But he ended up going back to jail and they ended up calling me and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing this again. I don't, I don't mess with habitual um, um, people who like to be in jail, who like to be in prison, state or federal. You've got to do something when you, uh, when you come out, something to which that is productive to humanity. But this is about uplifting humanity. Right? So regardless of the form in which testimony is um, introduced in proceedings and dispute, once a competent witness has submitted testimony by any means, including affidavit, the adverse party must disprove stated facts or prove 
um, alternative facts, prove application of the law, restate facts, and alternative facts in the event that the adverse party fails to comply with the two essentials, the testimony and the competent witness is established as uncontroverted evidence. For the most part, almost always, attorneys, including government attorneys, are not competent witnesses because, one, they did not have the first-hand knowledge of the facts. This is how we were able to um, um, sit this lawyer down. My wife had a um, court case. And my wife stood up and just dropped the load on him. All right? I mean, serious load. And the attorney, the assistant DA, she said, she stood up and she said, we, I would like to uh, recruit myself from any further possible lawsuits from Miss Kadera Tupac L. Bay's rights. I mean, and she said, my wife's whole name, she said, Miss Kadera Tupac. Um, um, L. Bay, I mean, just went in, just said her whole name and everything, and then sat down, you know. And the judge say, "You get back in there, you fight, you fight," you know. And so she tried again, all right. And this time, my wife. So, so we went on ahead with the case. The the judge um put the you know, once again, this is them going past, going beyond the um. The law, because once again, the lady did not rebut the affidavit. Okay, so the court case is actually already over. But the judge, he don't want it to be over, because he's the referee now, so he's cheating. So the police is on the stand. So ask the police, um, policeman. Um, my wife asked him, said, um. Who was there that night in question, um, you know? Who else was there? Anyone else here in this courtroom? He said, no. He said, who was there? He said, just you and myself. He said, so, was, so my wife said, oh, so okay, so it was just you and myself who was there, right? Okay, and so then my wife said, well, I would like to, um, um, I would like, based on the rules of evidence, you know, anything in which that the um, attorney, assistant um, attorney was safe, from here not would be hearsay. And therefore, based on the rules of evidence, um, hearsay is not inadmissible, um, is inadmissible in the court of law. She sat back down again and just looked at her friend and said, damn, that was a good one. <laughs> so this is what this is what you have to do. You have to think quickly. You have to think on your feet. All right, after that. She moved. She 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 left. She left that court um, courthouse. We went back the next time. They said um, they was mad at her because we made her leave. But we didn't make her leave per se. Like, oh no, we are gonna run you out of town. No, she she didn't want to keep violating people's rights. She, she oh she admitted that my wife was a princess, and that they had and that we had the right to be our own indigenous um nation, and that we shouldn't even have to be in their court system. So she was trying to be honorable. It was the judge who was trying to say, you fight, you fight. Ah, dude, you ain't getting no fighting going on because you are violated the maxims of law and you know it. Right? So right here, attorneys act under the authority of the system, not under their own unlimited liability and only relate secondhand information, which is related to them by others. Legally, therefore, what um, an attorney states is hearsay. This is what I'm talking about. So anything that they say, anytime that you hear a DA or assistant DA saying something, um, your honor, I object that is hearsay based on the rules of evidence. It is not the result of direct experience and cannot be attested on the basis of direct personal knowledge. Are you overstanding this? I hope you all are. The shit that I'm telling you can save you. As well as meeting criteria stated above as affidavits should idealistically have in paragraph numbered for the purpose of inter um, alia identifying particular points, passages for future references should rebuttal be attempted. 
right? This is why we number our facts. We but any of these facts that I just stated on our affidavit of nationality. You can't. Contain as many points for possible fault by um, violating any of the above stated criteria of the seven points of the seven points instruments, see seven point instruments in glossary. The more points, the more formidable. That's why we have more than seven points. You see our facts be going in. I had to cut it out. Brother George was like, uh, Jiro Moore was like, um, shoot, can we make the um, documents or paperwork a little bit smaller? So I had to make it smaller. I cut out like 40 pages. Because we are trying to make sure that there's no way that they can get around Islam. Islam. I heard you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I rest. <laughs> <laughs> so right here, we have a unique form number at the bottom, different from that of all other affidavits from ambiguous future reference and enhanced um, admissibilities as evidence. Four, be a plain statement of facts written in clear, written in clean, clear, matter of fact, minimalist um, style, just the facts, ma'am. Five, be written in the present tense, six, all right? And in the present tense, um, but however, it can be also based on the rules of evidence. You can use information from articles and has and from books as references in an affidavit. Okay, this is why we did that. All right? Avoid use of pronouns and words to infinity form is least ambiguous use and or which are ambiguous. The least ambiguity, the least um, need for a third party, say, such as a judge, to intervene in the matter of interpreting the text. Contain a few adjectives and adverbs if possible, um, such, um, since such color matters, and try to tell people what to think. All right. Often the more negatively words and terms are expressed, the more the, um, um, definitive and ironclad they are. Be signed in red ink signifying blood. All right. Nowadays they might not take the red ink, so you just do blue, which symbolizes commerce. Signing in the red blood acts as a signal um, that you, as the affinity, um, or stating the truth in the capacity of a sentient living being with unlimited liability and not a corporately colored artificial entity, trade name, operating in limited liability. Nine, have as much documentation, i.e. exhibits, attachments, and, and doc, um, documentary evidence supporting the assertions made in the affidavit as possible. Obviously, the more ink um, control on vertical, the substantiations, the better, right? So this is what we're talking about. This is how you have to write your affidavits, all right? And once again, you have to master the science of affidavits. Why? Because this is what you're dealing with when it comes to the science of law and dealing with what we call the UCC, all right? So when you look at the UCC process, all right, you have to know that you are doing affidavits and the reason why it's so important. And so we ask the question, why the UCC filing? Well, you already know that since 1933, um, the country has gone into a deep depression, Franklin D. Lionel Roosevelt, in which that they took the go from behind the money and now it's fiat no longer real currency is called fiat or frns and because of that um there's a problem right it says right here american will be required to register their biological property in a national system designed to keep track of the people and they will operate under the ancient system of pledging by such methodology and we can compel people to submit to our agenda. 
which we affect our security, our um, security as a chargeback for our fiat paper currency. Each American will be forced to register or suffer not being able to work or earn a living. They will be our chattel, and we will hold the security interest over them forever. By operating of the law merchant under the scheme of the secure transactions, Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivered the bills of laid into us, will be rendered bankruptcy or bankrupts and insolvent forever to remain economic slaves through taxation. Secured by their pledges, they will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designated to make us a profit, and they will be none the wiser for no one man in the millions can ever figure out the plan. That's what they thought. And if by accident one or two could figure it out, we have in our arsenal a possible deniability. Well, now millions of us have figured it out. Now what is going to happen? After all, this is the only logical way to fund the government. See, that's the only way to fund the government. By floating liens and debt to the registrants in form of benefits and privileges, not rights. They will inevitably rate to us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor to or to this fraud, which we call social insurance, which is social security. Without realizing it, each American will insure us for any loss we may insure or incur. And in the manner, every American will unknowingly be our sub um, servants, however, begrudgingly. The people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption. And we will employ the high office of the president of our dummy corporation to form this plot against America. This is Edward Mandel House. So this is what we're fighting up against by us mastering the science of these various forms. The estate, the executor of the estate, the trust information, as David Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller said, you want to be able to own, own, own nothing but control everything. That's by way of trust. And then mastering the UCC lien process. Right? This is what this is all talking about. Right? So we know your affidavits. Part of your affidavits um, when you're dealing with commercial law, you must have a denial of corporate status. You must have an affidavit, copyright, trademark, trade name, contract. As you see here, notice by declaration and affidavit of consequences for infringement of copyright, trademark, trade name. See, an affidavit. That's what I mean by affidavit at the top of the page, affidavit, copyright. You see? I won't read everything because it's too much. Attachment to Uniform Commercial Code, Financing Statement, UC, UCC-1. This financing statement is presented for filing, recording. The way to the UCC Commercial Code or the Uniform Commercial Code 10-104 and House Joint Resolution 192. That's, the, that's what Franklin, President Franklin D. Um, 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 Roosevelt did, Delano Roosevelt did back in the 1933, right? He formed the House Joint Resolution. That was under the New Deal, where you can be able to now pay paper for paper, right? And your birth certificate be the, uh, what is predicated as the debt instrument, right? Security, private agreement, non-negotiable, right? And that includes everything that you can think of here. Protection of, um, shoot, of everything, of your birth certificate, your social security card, of everything you can think of, your whole homeless indemnity clause or your whole homeless and indemnity clause or agreement 
as it is also called. You must have that part of the collateral, which is your property list. So all proceedings from security, um, secure party labor from every source, from products, accounts, fixtures, you know, crops, mine um, heads, well heads, transmitting utilities, etc. All rent, wages, earnings, uh, remunerations, remunerations, income from every source, all land, all properties and all documents involved, all real property, all cottages, cabins, houses, mansions, buildings of whatever type and whatever located, all bank accounts, foreign and domestic, or um, inventory from any source, all machineries, every farm and industrial, um, mechanical tools, et cetera, et cetera, all boats, yachts, watercraft, equipment, um, all aircraft, gliders, balloons, etc., all motor homes, trailers, mobile homes, recreational vehicles, houses, cargoes, travel trailers, etc., etc., all animals and all farm livestock, all pets, including cats, dogs, um, birds, fish, whatever, all of them, all right? Um, you can even claim your damn roaches if you want to, all right? All vehicles, autograph, um, automobiles, trucks, four um, four wheel vehicles, trailers, wagons, motorcycles, bicycles, tricycles, you know what I'm saying? You can, um, all computers, computer related equipment, accessories, flash drives. All right, so this collateral listing of properties protect all your property and assets. This portion actually needs to be also as um, in part of your family trust as well as also your irrevocable common law irrevocable trust. This um, I will put a portion of this same type of property listing for protection of assets into there. Okay. And then we have the truth affidavit in the nature of supplement mental uh, rules of administrative and maritime claim rule C. This is granting power of attorney in fact, right? You can fire all the trustees and then you can rename all the trustees by way. You can state that in this affidavit that you, um, um, that you fire all trustees operating fictitiously in the de facto government and you now um, by way of a Form 56 and fiduciary appointment letter, now state who are the true trustees, all right? And that's what you can do. That's what I recommend. All right? All right, the non-negotiable accepted for value, all right? It used to be in red, now we do it in blue because blue symbolizes commerce. And we don't want to stop commerce, so we don't use the color red when it comes to um, the UCC. We want to make sure that everything is in blue. All right? So as you see here, you have the employer's identification number, which is Social Security number. You have uh, for registration fees and command the memory of account. You see that. And this is the um, Social Security number, but without the dashes. You see employee um, identification once again, Social Security number. You come down, you see the post registered account. That is the red mail tab number. Um, um, that's actually in black on the red mail tab, which you would get from the United States Postal Service or office. You see the date, you see the invoice number, the invoice birth certificate number. That birth certificate number is actually, that's what that is, the state file number at the top of the right hand side of the birth certificate. You see the BC federal bond number that is actually the bond number that's in red on the birth certificate and you want to add the value of 100 um, trillion dollars um, and then you have the bond number which is the number on the back of your social security card which is the password so let's say the employee's identification number uh, with as well as also without the um, dashes is the users um, let's say that's the user um, name then the password on the back would be the bond number which is actually the IMF, which is the International Bond Number, um, International Monetary fund, fund Number. It is also known as um, the Prepaid Levy Bond Number, Prepaid Levy Bond Number. So you have your um, for, um, Fidelity Bond, which is part of it.
You have your declaration by affidavit in support of a bond to discharge debt. All right, this is what gives you the ability to see discharge debt. All right. This will give you your negotiable abilities as being secure party creditor. All right, so you want to make sure that you have that listed. You have nine or either negotiable chargeback, right? Some people do negotiable chargeback. Some do non-negotiable chargebacks, okay? As you see here, the prepaid, um, bonded prepaid account, back of Social Security card, invoice BC, invoice number on the birth certificate, is this is the um, state filing number, the social security number, uh, federal bond number, all right? Once again, and the federal bond number is on, the, on is the end number is in the red. Um, as you see, it has F. So remember, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all right? But they have the F in front, all right? So really, it's nine, it's nine numbers, and the F is in front, which symbolizes that this is Atlanta, Georgia, and this federal bond number for the birth certificate is found in Atlanta, Georgia. All right. So they have the bond, they have the birth certificate in Atlanta, Georgia, but then you see here at the top on the bonded prepaid account, you see G. All right, and G is in Cleveland, Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. So. Um, Right. This this is um this is this is where these bonds are located. Then you have the bonded registered bill of exchange. All right. You have the actual and construction notice. Right, this is the Board of Governors, non-negotiable instrument, Federal Reserve window, non-negotiable chargeback, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico! All right, so actual and constructive notice. So this would go to the individuals that we would refer to as um, the treasurers. If you look on the front of the, two, of the um, dollar bill, you would see two areas, one on the left, one on the right. You have um, the two treasurers, one located in Puerto Rico, one located in Washington, D.C., Right, the one located in um, Puerto Rico is in San Juan, Puerto Rico, right? Right, you have commercial notice, appointment of fiduciary creditor and debtor, right? This is how your appointment letter looks, after appointment of fiduciary, right? On this one, we have John um, Koshinskinen. Um, office, office of the Commissioner, Internal Revenue Service, right? That's his position as the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. He gets a Form 56 along with a um, an, an appointment um, notice, appointment of fiduciary um, appointment, right? United States Secretary, United States Department of State, Rex Tillerson, Jeff Sessions, United States um, Attorney General, United States Department of Justice. These are the individuals. And of course, you can do your, your local governor, your local state attorney, um, whoever, all right? Send those certified mail return receipt with the green slip sign. So you can do actually um, conf delivery confirmation and signature whichever way that you want to do it, but make sure you get that green slip back so you can attach it to your affidavits. You have a non-negotiable unlimited, unlimited private bond for set off. Okay. You have an administrative affidavit of Pacific nine, um, negative avertment opportunity to cure and countersuit or counterclaim, and right? this is very important because the opportunity to cure, right? The reason why this is important because this is what this says. Look at the counterclaim. 
Yeah, the Secretary of State now is um, um, Pompeo. Yeah. Um, thank you, Brother Gerald Moore. Exactly. It, it's, they changed so much in this administration, I can't keep up. <laughs> All right, so right here it says counterclaim. The following damages has been assessed against you if and when you fail to cure your dishonor in commerce as it is stated in the opportunity to cure contained herein. Failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted $1 million per account per violation per office or officer, agent, or representative who is involved with this action. Dishonor in commerce, $1 million, United States dollars per count per um, violation per officer, agent, or representative who is involved in this case. Collusion, $1 million. Um, theft of funds, $1 million. Racketeering, $1 million. Conspiracy, $1 million. So if you act in any way, shape, form, or fashion and based on per count, it's $1 million per count per off, um, offense or violation. Okay, so then of course you have the release of lien on real property, which is which is the optional form ninety. Then you have the release of personal property from escrow. Escrow is jail, prison, which is um, what we uh, refer to as optional form ninety one. Right, and you have a standard form twenty eight. Right, which is affidavit of individual surety, as you see here. See, these are the contracts that go along with your UCC. Most people just think by doing a UCC that they finished. They're not. You see all these affidavits that you have to add to the UCC. Otherwise, your UCC has no strength. Okay? Has no strength. All right. So when we look at the UCC, all right, we put the depository trust company as the, the um as what we refer to as the um, debtor. You can put the hospital in which that you was conceived in. You can put on um, the county or state that has your birth certificate or that make copies of your birth certificate. And of course, you can put um, your secure party name, you can do it in all caps, as that's the name, which is the birth name in which that they go after. You can make that a secure party, and then the additional secure party, then you can make that name your um, your indigenous appellation as the additional secure party. Okay, so that both of you can play the game. The name in all caps, which is the birth name. All right, as well as also the name here, which is the additional secure party name, right, which is your indigenous appellation name now. All right, so now you can play the game in both manners, which is necessary. And right here, you want to see, you see the X right here on number 6A. Go to 6A. Hey, okay, right here is 6A. You have check only if equitable and check only one box. You have um, public finance transaction, manufactured home transaction. A debtor is a transmitting utility. When you're utilizing the name for the first time, that is the box that you would mark right there. Is a debtor is a transmitting utility. Then when you go down to 6B, it says check only if equitable and and Click only one box, it says agricultural lien. And in this case, it says non-UCC filing. You will mark non-UCC filing because this is the one that you're going to file at the um that you're going to file at the county. Right? And this is what it says. So this is a entry of collateral on behalf of the debtor. All right. 
estate, set the queue trust in favor of the secured party creditor in Disney's appellation, executed in um, the um, commercial chamber under necessity, and the following property is hereby registered, claiming lien in the same manner. All right? And as you see, you can put the birth certificate number, the state file number on the birth certificate as it is, the bond number, the number on the back of the social security card, your social security card number, and then list all the contracts that you have that will be attached to this UCC, right? It says security agreement, whole harmless indemnity clause, power of attorney, as you see here, um, it says uh, release or lien real property, personal property from, uh, release personal property from escrow, Aff um, affidavit of individual surety, which is 28 form. So you can list all of the affidavits with I, that we just went over and list them right here in the collateral listing, right? And notice that we use, all right, depository, depository trust company. Why? Because they are the ones who has the long form, who had the long form of your birth certificate, which was delivered to them via from um, the hospital, all right? Of course, there's a, there's a, you know, a, um, it takes a, you know, um, they go through some subsidiary other agencies before it gets there, but once, once they get there to the DDC, the DDC puts it on the stock market, in which that's when somebody is able to um, purchase it, all right? So as you see here, this new space, All right, all assets, all accounts, contract rights, documents, collateral papers, or chattel papers, general intangibles, um, inventory, letters of credit, lines of credit, equipment and fixtures, whether presently owned or acquired in the future, or um, cessations, um, additions, replacements, substitutions, all records of any kind relating to any of the foregoing or proceedings, including insurance, bonds, stocks, general intangibles, and account proceeds, together with all the other real and personal properties, including but not limited to any property not specifically listed, name or listed by model, um, serial number, title, or non-title interest in, a, in, acts, in um, assets, um, possessions, property, resources, and license, etc. Optional form 90, release on lien for personal property. Optional form 91, release of personal property from escrow. Um, standard form 28, affidavit of individual surety, attach. So you want to make sure that you have here in the real estate records, you have the parcel number as well as the location, and you can also put the legal description of the property, all right? On this side, it's a description of the um, real property. You can go and tell them that it's a parcel number and then also give the optional form 90, 91, and standard form 28 because it will also be listed there. When you see miscellaneous, this is where um, you can um, put um, some other information if you have it. Otherwise, optional filler reference data in this area, this is where you can put your name, um, this is where you was um, autographed at here, all right? Now, if you're doing it at the state level, at the state level, it says the um, alternative designation is actable. You will mark lease, leaser. You will mark cosigner. Co you will mark seller, buyer. You will mark bailer, ba bailey, bailer. You will mark li um, license, leaser and you will mark agricultural lien. And this time leave blank. Now UCC filing. All right. And at the state level is a claim of lien. All right, so that's the two places you will put it. You put it at the county, non-UCC non filing. At the state will be a claim of lien. So at the county is the is the lien. At the state is a claim of lien. All right. So that's the way in which that you want to um, do that. All right. So that is the science 
um, for today as far as on the UCC. Um, and this is, is the last thing, is take your UCC into court. In order to bring the administrative law into court, you must follow a very careful and specific procedure. When you bring the um, administrative law into court, you take part in the court authority away from the judge. Let me explain how. The courts have consistently ruled over the years that there is regulations and laws, both in state and federal level, that makes it clear that courts cannot adjudicate the UCC or the Uniform Commercial Code. They can deal with that. They deal with a gray area. I have found a number of court cases that have dealt with that, or with the, um, for example, in a particular case, which this is valid and legitimate crops being grown that fits under dispute that is going on. Is that the legitimate argument, a legitimate claim? But when it comes to the point of the UCC that you file at the Secretary of State, that is stamped with their seal in the upper right hand corner. When you bring that into court, they cannot contest it. But I will tell you, do not bring it in court by walking it in and lay it down before the judge and say, here, I filed the UCC, because the judge would say, so what? What you have to do is to bring it in, and it has to go into, um, into the record, three different records. So the first thing you do before you can enter the um, court for the case, it is you prepare. You have your UCC, your affidavits, your notice of default, etc., or your administrative paperwork, and you attach them as exhibits to um, to notice to include an argument and augment the record. Did you hear me? You don't bring a motion. You bring a notice. Remember, I told you there's two things that the judge can't judge on: a notice and an affidavit. So here, you're dealing with notices now. You bring a notice to include and augment the record. This is a distinct difference. The judge would like to, um, for you to bring in a motion because when you file a notice attached to it, um, your administrative action under the Uniform Commercial Code and Administrative Law, the judge cannot rule on it. But like I told you before, a judge can rule on a motion. And nine times out of 10, or 99.9999% out of 10, he's gonna deny your motion. Now, I will give you a warning. There's a couple of judges in matters right now, one in Illinois and one in California, uh, where they attempt to um, circumvent that. And so I had um, noticed both that was involved in that, um, both parties that they had, um, because take action and appeal what is happening. Because if it is not taken out of the hands of the judge and in the court of the appeals, it is, if it's left to stand, somebody is going to pick it up pick up on it and start and try to use it and get the leverage and then we get um, and we'll get um, off the track again, All right? So, but the consistency over the last, I've, I've done a study on it, over the last 70 years, the consistency is that when a UCC or administrative law is brought properly in the court, the judge will say nothing about it. They are silent. And that is exactly what we want because remember now, when it started out as amorality has moved right into equity. And so we go to the court, the clerk of courthouse, and we have our notice to include and augment the record. And it lists all the administrative laws and UCCs in exhibit in the document. And that includes your affidavit of truth and your notice of default and SN, and you bring those to the clerk of courthouse. And you want to bring at least three copies because she's going to stamp one. And oh, by the way, this is how you have proof of service on it. Right? You have to have proof of service on it and you have to notify the other party, even though it's still a notice, they still have to be noticed. I'm notified because the judge will jump on that and he will reject it or the clerk will reject it if you don't have a proof of service um, to the other parties for it. Now the clerk will stamp that and ask, her to stamp the other copies as a courtesy. She will stamp those also. You have to have four copies. Then you will take the other three, keep one for yourself. Um, then either you or another party will go to the courtroom with the um, court um, case is assigned and they will walk it in. And I tell people um, it's best if you do it when the court is in session. Let me explain why, because then you can walk it in 
up to the dividing bar and hand it to the bailiff and quietly say, will you give this to the clerk? I don't want to bother her. Um, but note the name on the one you give it to the bailiff because then you can make a note in, um, of that in your records. So if you say bailiff Williams, you know, that's who I handed it to. But by those two um, actions, you have now put in the court file with the um, clerk of court, um, your notice to include an augmented record of all exhibits attached. Then when you walk into the courtroom, you have the bailiff hand them to the clerk. Now the clerk has been served and you have it in the court records because she's required, having been handed those by the bailiff to give a copy of the judge and to oppose an attorney, all right? Now, when the case is called, you walk forward responding as the secure party. I do not call the judge my honor. I just say, sir or ma'am. Of course, it doesn't matter. You ain't got to do all of that. Just say, um, yes, your honor. I'm here as the secure party, and I have before the court a notice to include an argument to record, which includes the following exhibits. And I begin reading them off, and I include the words in that for the record, because in most courts, there will be someone sitting there who is taking a record, all right? A, a sonographer is there. And by doing that, I now have gotten it into the court records. I have now gotten it into the court records, and now I get it into the court transcript, all right? So that is the key, all right? That's one of the ways um, that you can definitely do that, all right? So um, are there any questions concerning anything that I've gone over? John, uh, Dr. Aline. Yes. I um I wasn't in at the start. I was following what you were going. To, are these the new forms that uh, we're using um, for filing uh, all paperwork needed? Um, not necessarily new, but definitely. Um, well, not new, but the reconfigured. Right. Pardon me. Right, right, right. To solidify um, our position um, in all matters. So yes. From um, the, the, is it um, possible to get a recording of this? Yeah. I'd like to go over it. I want to okay. Go over well, it, it should be available um, right after class. It won't be developed, um, available. Available. Um, soon after, but it will be available right after this class. Oh, so, yeah. It's long. All right, it's long. Any other questions? All right, if there's no questions, I'm going to end class for tonight. I'm going to say uh, to watch till Easter, everyone, and we'll see everybody here on Thursday. All right, to watch till Easter. Ah, sim, mas já está aí. Ah, sim, mas já está aí. Ah, sim, mas já está aí.